This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for August 21st through the 27th. On this week's show, we discuss an iconic movie musical that owes its later pop culture status to television. We also discuss the death of a manager, and we say happy birthday to more than a few musical legends. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. First off, let's talk about a movie that owes its getting made to a Disney movie of all things, and this movie was also plagued with a whole lot of problems. For starters, this movie musical had at least 18 different writers touching its script, yet only three received the official writing credit. It went through a number of casting changes, including turning down two Hollywood legends, and it barely made any money for its studio. And yet, it was a critical success, was up for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, and later found its success in pop culture status when it started getting played on television. This movie was originally a silent movie back in 1910, but the sound version was only greenlit by its studio, MGM, because of the success earlier of Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which proved that audiences would go to see movies based on children's books, which this original movie is based on. The original script for the movie was pretty dark, and MGM hated it. They gave it to three different writers to come up with something different, but didn't tell the writers that each of them were writing the screenplay. Then they took the best ideas, flushed out the characters, gave it to a bunch more writers to punch up the script, and finally they had a working script to work with. Out of all of those writers, though, only three of them received official credit for the screenplay. Noel Langley, Florence Ryerson, and Edgar Allan Wolfe. Next came the casting. Hollywood legend W.C. Fields had a great role lined up in it, but he couldn't agree on the money, so he was dropped. Another Hollywood legend, Shirley Temple, was supposedly up for the main role, but things didn't work out there either. Actress Deanna Durbin was also up for the main role, but was dropped. Most think it was because her singing style was very operatic and thus not exactly appropriate for this movie. Buddy Epson, who later found fame on television on the TV show Barnaby Jones and also on the Beverly Hillbillies, was up for a role but was forced out when another actor who already had a role in the movie, Ray Bolger, wanted Buddy's role instead. Even the directing had problems. There were actually four directors during production, although Victor Fleming received the directing credit because it was really his vision that made this movie. Finally, on August 25th, 1939, the movie was released. It made just over $3 million or $65 million in today's money. However, it had a movie budget of $2.777 million or just over $60 million in today's money. So in actuality, it originally netted around $5 million in today's money, give or take, which by Hollywood standards means that it originally made absolutely nothing. However, it was a critical success, and it was nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Picture, which was then known as the Outstanding Production Award, where it was mowed down by a juggernaut of a movie that year called Gone with the Wind. Fun fact for you. Gone with the Wind is actually the biggest movie of all time if you base it on the number of ticket sales, beating out all of the Star Wars movies, Titanic, Avengers, and Avatars. Go figure. Oh, this particular movie, by the way, did clean house in the music categories at the Academy Awards, taking home Best Original Score and Best Original Song. However, it wasn't the end for this movie. 
As a matter of fact, in 1956, CBS aired the movie on television, and it was so popular, much like the movie The Ten Commandments on ABC every Easter, that CBS started airing it on television every single year. So much so that it is now considered a pop culture classic, along with other movies that bombed at the box office but found life on television, like It's a Wonderful Life and The Christmas Story. It's now a part of the National Film Registry and the Library of Congress. It also made 10 different American Film Institute best of lists. The movie that had W.C. Field as the wizard, that role went to Frank Morgan. Shirley Temple, then Deanna Durbin as Dorothy, until that role went to the legendary Miss Judy Garland. Ray Bulger, who originally had the role of the Tin Man, but wanted the role of the Scarecrow so badly that he forced out Buddy Ebsen, who was far more gracious about it than I think I would have been. The movie that had witches, ruby slippers, and gave munchkins lifelong employment by getting paid to go to sci-fi conventions, and the movie who also won Best Original Song at the Academy Awards for the song Over the Rainbow... The Wizard of Oz, of course, premiered in wide release in movie theaters on August 25th, 1939. Next, no one knew it at the time, but a young woman who was on television the night of January 21st, 1957, would go on to become a country music icon, and it took a reality TV show to do it. Back in the 1940s and 50s, Arthur Godfrey was the Dick Clark, or Ryan Seacrest, you might say, of television. He had a bunch of shows, both on radio and television, and was a household name. One of his shows was called Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, where amateur entertainers would get their big break. It was a contest show. People would go on, do their performances, and the audience would pick the winner. Think of it as American Idol before there was such a thing. Now, in order to be on the show, you had to audition for it. Some people who were deemed not worthy to be on the show were Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley. Go figure. That does not, however, detract from the show's track record. Their list of soon-to-be stars who got their start on the show included Tony Bennett, Pat Boone, comedian Lenny Bruce, and Marilyn Horn. On January 21st, 1957, this young woman from Winchester, Virginia, went on the show and performed the song Walking After Midnight. She won the contest that night, and that was when the world first heard of the name Patsy Cline. Patsy was born Virginia Patterson Hensley on September 8, 1932 in Winchester, Virginia. She started out singing locally in Virginia at the age of 15. She married her first husband, Gerald Klein, in 1953 and was signed to the Four Star Record Label in 1954. Over the next couple of years, Patsy had a couple of small hits, 1955's A Church, A Courtroom, Then Goodbye, and 1956's I've Loved and Lost Again, but not much more. In 1957, she performed nationally on Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, and after that, her life changed. In 1957, Patsy divorced Gerald Klein, but kept his last name for working purposes. She then got married to Charlie Dick later in the year, and in 1958, she had a child. She moved to Nashville, Tennessee in 1958 to further her career. She found new management, became a member of the Grand Ole Opry, and signed to Decca Records. Patsy had a serious car accident in 1961, which took her about six months to recover from. Patsy would go on to have many hits from 1960 to 1963, including this particular classic, which is why we're talking about her for this week. The song Crazy was written by country music legend Willie Nelson, who was not a legend at this particular time. Willie had gotten a recording contract with D Records in Houston, Texas, and had gotten a gig at the Esquire Ballroom there. He was also a DJ at a radio station in Pasadena, Texas. During his commutes back and forth between Pasadena and Houston, Willie wrote songs that he would try to sell. The song Crazy was one of those songs. It took him less than an hour to write it. 
His mindset at the time was that he was wondering if he was crazy for doing this commute back and forth to try to provide for his family, but he ended the song as if the relationship of the person in the song was ending. Willie's relationship for the record was not. He was just tired from the commute. Patsy Cline's producer, Owen Bradley, liked the song and thought that it would be good for Patsy because of the jazzy chord progression in the song, which was definitely not country-like. Owen brought it to Patsy's husband, who then brought it to Patsy. When Patsy Cline's husband first brought the song to her attention, he reportedly said, quote, the song's crazy, end quote, to which Patsy then reportedly said, quote, it certainly is. End quote. Guess she wasn't a big fan of the original version. To be fair to her, though, Willie's demo track had him speaking the words instead of singing them. Patsy eventually gave it a chance, though. Recording sessions for the song started on August 21st, 1961 and finished on September 15th, 1961. Owen Bradley played organ and produced the song. The legendary Nashville Session Musician Collective, known as the Nashville A-Team, were the other musicians on the record. That included Owen's younger brother, Harold, on electric bass, future country superstar Floyd Kramer on piano, Buddy Harmon on drums, Walter Haynes on steel guitar, Randy Hughes on acoustic guitar, Grady Martin on electric guitar, and Bob Moore on acoustic bass. The backing vocals for the song were done by Elvis Presley's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame backup vocal group, The Jordanaires. Patsy Cline's version of the song Crazy was released on October 16, 1961 for her album Showcase. That's the name of the album, not an album showcase, by the way. The song became a huge hit, going to number two on both the Billboard Country and Adult Contemporary charts, and number nine on the Pop Singles chart. It was also included in the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry in 1992 and the Grammy Music Hall of Fame in 2024. On Rolling Stone Magazine's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time list, it is ranked at number 85. On their 200 Greatest Country Songs of All Time list, it's at number 3. There have been, of course, other versions of the song recorded, including one by Willie himself, who released it for his 1962 debut album, And Then I Wrote. Patsy Cline's legendary version of the Willie Nelson-written song, Crazy, which started recording sessions on August 21st, 1961. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Next, we mourn the loss of the manager for the Beatles, Mr. Brian Epstein. There's a lot of debate about who the mysterious fifth Beatle was. I would say that there were actually six Beatles who were all equally responsible for their success. Of course, you have the Fab Four with John, Paul, George, and Ringo, but you have to put Sir George Martin up there since he helped to craft their sound, especially on their last five or six albums. You also have to put their early success up there to their manager, Brian Epstein. Brian Epstein was running his family record store back in the early 1960s in Liverpool, England. He heard about the Beatles from a couple of guys who came into the record store and asked for Beatles records. And legend has it that during a break from the store, he decided one day to walk over a few blocks to the Cavern Club to hear the Beatles play. At the time, the Beatles were trying to manage themselves. Any musician these days will tell you that even with the internet, that's a pretty daunting task. So imagine how tough it was back in the 1960s to do. 
Brian knew that even though he had never really managed a band before, he did have really good business sense. He convinced the band, then at the time with Pete Best on drums and not with Ringo, to let him manage them for 25% of the band's gross earnings. The contract was for five years. Now that is a lot for a manager to take, that 25%. But consider that without Brian, the Beatles might have been stuck forever in Liverpool as just another local band that didn't live up to its potential. For starters, Brian gave them their image. He got them to dress in suits instead of the leather outfits they had. The bowing together after each song? Brian's idea. Brian got them their first record contract, and after that, they were off and running. The one big problem with this whole deal was when it came to publishing rights. For those wondering how Paul McCartney didn't own the rights to his own songs, pay attention. Back in 1963, Brian convinced the guys to start a publishing arm called Northern Songs. The company was mainly owned by two guys named Dick James and Charles Silver, who had 51% of the company. Remember, this company was formed to take care of the rights to the songs that John and Paul wrote. You would have thought that they should be the majority owners. In actuality, they only owned 20% each. They then had their own company with their rights along with it sold out from under them. Always be majority owners in whatever creative endeavors you're doing, kids, and let that be a lesson to you. From that aspect, Brian actually wasn't really good for the band, but he was the glue that kept the band together. That glue, unfortunately, began to come apart in 1967. Brian had a history of insomnia and was taking prescription pills to get over it. Hey, I know, tale as old as time, and you already know where this is heading. Around the time of his death, he had just gotten out of a clinic where he was trying to get help for his insomnia and addiction to pain medications. He was supposed to be entertaining some guests that night, but they didn't show until after he had left his country home where they were supposed to be heading to. He drove back to London, drank some alcohol, and took six pills of Carbitrol to help him sleep. It was the combination of the two that killed him. He was later found dead by his butler on August 27th, 1967. A lot of people believe that it was after that time when the writing was on the wall for the Beatles to split apart. They didn't know how to take care of the business end of things. That was Brian's job. Brian was also the band referee. Without him... There really wasn't anyone there to do it, although Sir George Martin did try. In the end, the fights, Yoko, eh, it all became a mess, and the Beatles finally called it quits. The beginning of the end, as some people say, was when Brian Epstein, manager of the Beatles, passed away from an accidental drug overdose on August 27th, 1967, He was 32 years old at the time. All right, after that depressing story, let's talk about some other things, including celebrating some birthdays, although one of them will probably end kind of depressing. Just giving you a little warning. First up, though, Before we do some birthdays, we spoke about this particular item on our July 31st to August 6th edition of the podcast when we talked about their music video for the song Jeremy. However, let us briefly mention that Pearl Jam's album 10 was released on August 27th, 1991. That album, along with Nirvana's album Nevermind, became Generation X Landmarks and helped to usher in the 1990s grunge era. It is an extremely important album when it comes to the history of 20th century music, as it turns out. So there you go. 
You can listen to the July 31st through August 6th edition of the Music History In-Depth podcast. It's already dropped on this network. Just search backwards. You will find it. It's really good, especially with the making of the music video for the song Jeremy. Very entertaining. Next to the birthdays. Let's start with this one. This man is a music legend. He was a composer and also a conductor. His mark was made on Broadway mainly. He wrote music for West Side Story, Peter Pan, Candide, On the Town, On the Waterfront, and a bunch more. He also had a TV series of classical music concerts geared towards getting kids to love music. Bradley Cooper just played him in an Academy Award-nominated movie. His name is Leonard Bernstein, who was born on August 25th, 1918. Next, this man is another music legend. He was a jazz pianist and a band leader. He started out his career by working the lights and doing piano for silent movies at a vaudeville theater. He started touring in bands playing piano until he formed his own band, and among his legendary recordings is his signature song, One O'Clock Jump. His name is Count Basie, born August 21st, 1904. Switching gears out of the golden age of entertainment for this next one, this woman became the youngest person ever admitted to the Peabody Institute of John Hopkins University at the age of five. She then got kicked out of it at the age of 11. Rock and roll, baby. She was in a band called Why Can't Tori Read before going solo, with 16 studio albums to her credit and counting. Her many hits include Cornflake Girl, Crucify, Silent All These Years, and a sort of fairy tale. She is the Tori in Why Can't Tori Read, Miss Tori Amos, born August 22, 1963. This Canadian musician is an original member of his band. The other two members were drummer John Rutsey and bass player and singer Jeff Jones. Rutsey would be replaced by a guy by the name of Neil Peart, while Jones would be replaced by a guy by the name of Getty Lee. The man was born Alexander Nevojinovich. You know him better as the guitarist for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame band Rush, Mr. Alex Lifeson, born August 27th, 1953. Drummer Keith Moon of The Who was born on August 23, 1946 in Wembley, England. Moon's drumming was revolutionary. He treated the drum kit as an instrument in its own right, emphasizing the fills, the cymbal crashes, and the tom-tom solos. His energetic and innovative approach helped to define The Who's raw, powerful sound, and his influence on subsequent generations of drummers is pretty much undeniable. He is known as the greatest drummer to ever live by most people. However, Moon's life was marked by equal parts brilliance and also chaos. Known for his extravagant and often destructive behavior, he became as famous for his antics as he did for his musical talent. From blowing up hotel bathrooms to extravagant parties, Moon's legendary status was cemented as much by his wild lifestyle as his drumming prowess. In other words, man lived it like a rock and roll star should. Tragically, Keith's life was cut short at the age of 32 due to an accidental overdose of medication. His death was a devastating loss for the group The Who and, well, let's be blunt, for the music world in general. Despite his tumultuous life, Moon's legacy is one of the greatest rock drummers, if not the greatest rock drummer of all time. I know some people would say John Bonham, but really, eh, I don't know. I, I think I, I'm a Keith Moon guy. That legacy remains intact. His impact on music is immeasurable, and his name is synonymous with raw energy, musical innovation, rock and roll excess, and passing out almost every night on the drum kit. <laughs> rock and roll. The legendary drummer Keith Moon of The Who, born August 23rd, 1946. These last two birthday mentions are for the Gen X crowd, including myself. 
First off, this is the one that'll probably end depressing. Sorry, you've been warned. Lane Staley was born on August 22nd, 1967, six months after Kurt Cobain of Nirvana. Lane's parents divorced when Lane was seven. He also grew up a Christian scientist, but once he turned 16, he disavowed the church. He tooled around in a few small bands that went absolutely nowhere, and then one day in a rehearsal studio, he met guitarist Jerry Cantrell. They were roommates for a time and played in a funk band together, if you can believe that. Jerry was interested in starting a different group with Sean Kinney on drums and Mike Starr on bass. They asked Lane to be the lead singer. He actually said no. Jerry knew that eventually Lane would join, so when Lane was around, Jerry manipulated the situation by auditioning singers who weren't as good just to get Lane all fired up to finally say yes. Apparently, the clincher was when Jerry auditioned a male stripper to be lead singer. They eventually ended up naming their little group Alice in Chains. A local promoter heard the band play in a local club and got them to do some demos. The promoter then took the demos to the managers of local band Soundgarden, who in turn sent them to Columbia Records. Alice in Chains were signed, and on August 21, 1990, their first album, Facelift, was released. It became a big hit a little over a year later, thanks in no small part to Nirvana, who ended up releasing their major label debut, Nevermind, in 1991. Once Nirvana broke through, Alice broke through, along with Soundgarden and Pearl Jam, in pretty rapid succession. And within a few months, these four bands and their lead singers became spokespeople for their generation, i.e. Generation X, my generation. Pearl Jam's Eddie Vedder ended up on the cover of Time magazine. Both Pearl Jam and Nirvana ended up on separate covers of Rolling Stone magazine. Lane, however, dealt with the pressure of fame by doing drugs. His drug use got so bad that the band was having trouble putting tours together. Still, the band was loyal to Lane and never kicked him out of the band officially. They all just went and did different projects. One of their last shows together was the MTV Unplugged performance. His last official performance with Alice in Chains was a concert in Kansas City, Missouri on July 3rd, 1996. In October of 1996, Lane's former fiance, Demry Lara Perot, passed away from a drug overdose. That, according to many of his friends, was the death knell for Lane. It was almost as if life had gone from his body by then. He started using heavily, and it started to show, and at one point, he weighed only 80 pounds and was losing his teeth. He would show up in public every now and then, sometimes at one of Jerry's concerts, sometimes singing with another side project. He became increasingly isolated, though, from his friends and family. According to bassist Mike Starr, who had left Alice in Chains early on and was replaced by Mike Inez, Starr went to Lane's place on April 4th. He could tell that Lane wasn't well and had thought about calling 911. Lane apparently talked him out of it. The two, though, got into a fight, and one thing led to another, and Starr stormed out of Lane's house with Lane yelling at him to not leave him like this. All of that according to Starr, who himself would die of a drug overdose in 2011. Star would be the last person to see Lane alive. On April 5th, 2002, exactly eight years to the day of Kurt Cobain's suicide, Lane took a combination of heroin and cocaine and overdosed. His body was found two weeks later by police who were there searching for him once he was reported missing. His body was partially decomposed at that point, and he had to be identified by his dental records, which wasn't easy because he had lost a lot of his teeth from doing drugs. A very sad end for a very, very talented front man. Lane Staley of Alice in Chains was born, though, on August 22, 1967. Finally, Rick Springfield was born Richard Springthorpe on August 23, 1949 in Australia. 
His father was in the Australian Army. He started out in his teenage years playing in a bunch of different bands with names like Zoot, MPD Limited, and such. He signed a solo record deal with Spamic Records in 1971. His debut album, Beginnings, was released in 1972. A single off of that album, Speak to the Sky, hit number 14 on the Billboard Singles Chart and the album went top 40. Some radio stations boycotted his songs, though, once word got out, true or false, that his record label in America, Capitol Records, was paying people to actually buy the album, which I'm not quite sure if it's as bad as Milli Vanilli, but I don't know. You be the judge. In the 1970s, Rick also put out three other albums, gaining an image as a teen idol along the way. He also started acting at this point. He was in episodes of The Six Million Dollar Man, The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew Mysteries. Ooh, remember that show? That was a good show. Parker Stevenson, good crew. Anyway, there was Wonder Woman, the Linda Carter version, The Rockford Files with James Gardner, of course, and he was in the pilot episode of the original Battlestar Galactica TV show, where he played a pilot who doesn't even make it past the pilot episode. Rest in peace, Lieutenant Zack. We barely knew you. But we couldn't have done the, well, one season cult hit without you. As the 1980s dawned, Rick was offered the role of Dr. Noah Drake on the TV soap opera General Hospital. At the time, kids, soap operas were huge. General Hospital's Luke and Laura wedding episode was and still is one of the most watched television episodes of all time. Rick said yes to the offer because he didn't think that the album that he was working on at the time, Working Class Dog, was going to even do well. Much like his last couple of albums, actually. In the very beginning... It kind of looked like Working Class Dog was going to go down that same exact road. But then, one of the songs on Working Class Dog got red hot. The song Jesse's Girl was written by Rick about his lust for his friend Gary's girl, who, for the record, was not named Jesse. The song was released in February 1981, but did not hit the Billboard chart until the last week of March. As the year went on, the song became more popular, which drove ratings up for General Hospital. And as more people realized that Dr. Noah Drake on General Hospital was also the guy on the radio, more people bought both the song and the album. It took 19 weeks to do it, but finally, in August of 1981, just in time for MTV's debut, the song hit number one on the Billboard singles chart. His video getting played on MTV in the early years of MTV only kept the song around even longer. It became Rick's biggest single of his career. Rick became so popular that he would work on the soap opera during the weekdays and then go on tour gigs with his band on the weekends. He would win the Grammy Award for Best Male Rock Vocal Performance and would have a lot of hits in the 1980s like Don't Talk to Strangers, Affair of the Heart, Calling All Girls, I've Done Everything for You, Human Touch, and many, many more. He has acted on and off on General Hospital in the past four decades and he still puts out albums every now and then and he definitely goes out on tour virtually every single year. The legendary singer-actor and writer, of course, of the huge hit Jesse's Girl, Mr. Rick Springfield, born August 23rd, 1949. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth Podcast for August 21st through the 27th. Thank you very, very much for listening and or watching if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever. 